Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our session. My name is Sidi Rakolote from the Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute. It's a public trust created to run public benefit activities. One of those activities that we are running are dialogues. And in terms of our dialogues, we choose various topics and invite speakers that will come and share their experiences in relation to those topics. Colleagues, most of you might be aware that the people of Western Sahara are suffering. Human rights violations are reported commonly within the area of the Western Sahara. Since the late 19th century, when the territory was colonized by Spain, when Spain withdrew in around 1975, a war broke out between Morocco, Mauritania, and the Polisario Front over the control of Western Sahara. After some years, to be exact, around four years, Mauritania retreated, but the fight between Morocco and the Polisario Front uh, continued. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we'll be talking about Western Sahara, a thorn in the flesh of the African Union. Colleagues, we are so blessed that amongst us, we have a convener of the South African chapter of the Friends of Western Sahara, a part of the international movement that supports Western Sahara for the freedom of that country. Also amongst us, with His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed Desai, representing the Sahari Arab Democratic Republic in South Africa. Joining us also will be delegates from the Western Sahara delegation from the Pan-African Parliament, who only arrived the past Saturday from the refugee camps in Algeria. Comrades and friends, we are so fortunate also to have amongst us the person who will be speaking about this topic. He'll be leading us on this topic on Western Sahara. We have one of our own, a person who has lived within the area of the Western Sahara. He joined the African National Congress and its military wing in Kondowesiswe. He qualified as a detachment battalion commander at the military school in Crimea, Ukraine and traveled to the former Soviet Union and Cuba on missions of the ANC and MK. Between 1975 and 1986, he operated as a front commander in Botswana, Swaziland, and Mozambique. He rose to become the deputy chief of military intelligence in 1998, deputizing Comrade Ronika Srils, and in 1989, a chief of military of, uh, intelligence of MK, he worked closely with the late Comrade Chris Hani, the then Chief of Staff, and the late Joe Mudise. He was deployed alongside the guerrillas of Polisario Front in Morocco, occupied Western Sahara, and they brought back tactics of the Polisario Front, which were used, among others, to, attack, to successfully attack the Slari military base in the form of Uptatuana. Comrades and friends and fellow uh, participants in this uh, webinar, Allow me to introduce to you the Major General Keith Mukwape, who is going to take us through the politics of Western Sahara, the past and the current. Thank you. Without a waste of time, without a waste of time, I will request uh, Comrade Keith Mukwape to take the stage. Comrade Keith. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, Comrade Keith. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Comrade Keith. Right. Um, I, I, had, I had lost connection. But we can hear you. OK, just give me one small minute. Thank you, Comrade Keith. Yeah. Colleagues, in the meantime, while we're giving our speaker some minutes, we have shared with you the map of the Western Sahara. The yellow, so. area, the yellow area that you'll be seeing is an occupied area or uh, the area that has been occupied by Morocco. 
and Comrade Keith will take us through the map, giving us his experience around operating in that area. And also at the end, we'll allow His Excellency Ambassador to give the closing remarks. Colleagues, after the presentation of Comrade Keith, will allow you an opportunity to give input, comment, and ask questions. And in the answering of those questions, Comrade Keith and His Excellency Ambassador will lead in answering some, some of the questions. While we are waiting for Comrade Keith, colleagues, just look at the map that I've just shared with you, the map of the Western Sahara. As indicated, the yellow part represent an area that has been occupied by Morocco currently. Over to you, uh, uh, General Keith. Thank you very much. Uh, one minute. I think I've got some load shedding in this area of mine. I don't know. But uh, I'll cover it up. I'll cover it up by ensuring that I close one part and open the other. Right. Okay. Are you fine with me now? We are fine with you, uh, uh, General Keith. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Rakolote, and uh, your Progressive Socio-Economic Investment Institute. Um, I'm with me. I, I'm I'm here with uh, the Ambassador, His Excellency Mohammed Beisad, the Ambassador of the Sahara. Arab Democratic Republic based in, in uh, Pretoria. I'm also here with the uh, members of the chapter, South African chapter, part of the international movement that supports the people of Western Sahara. Um, I will first start by, as you had already indicated, that map is at the northwest corner of uh, our continent. And you can see Mauritania to the south of Western Sahara, the Mediterranean Sea on the left, and uh, Morocco on the west, and a small portion on the east that is Algeria. Um, in 1884, Spain proclaimed the area along the coast west of Morocco and uh, as its protectorate and progressively expanded into the interior, consolidating an, an area of 266,000 square kilometers. That would be the combined size of Northwest Province and Limpopo. And uh, in 1958, uh, then said that territory is Spanish, Spanish Sahara. Now, Morocco itself gained independence in 1956. Um, and uh, uh, from then on, uh, began encroaching on uh, on the borders and across the borders of Western Sahara into Spanish Sahara. And the people of, of Sahara themselves uh, demanded independence as a people. And in 1975, Spain relented and as it withdrew, it handed over the administration of that territory to Morocco and Mauritania. In that same year, the UN, on the basis of what Morocco, of, of what Spain had done, then uh, approached the International Court of Justice, which in turn offered an advisory opinion that there is no evidence of any tie of territorial sovereignty 
between Western Sahara and Morocco. Morocco, however, mobilized 300,000 of its own citizens together with heavily armed army units and, and did what was called the Green March and invaded and occupied the whole of Western Sahara at the instructions and orders of King Hassan II. Thus began the occupation and annexation of Western Sahara and the war of liberation by the people's movement called the Polisario Front. Thousands of Sahara Sahrawi people fled to neighboring Algeria, settling in Tindouf. And you can see Tindouf on that map, that's a small little town on the um, southwest part of Algeria, settled there. And, and, and where today we have more than 170,000 refugees, plus or minus 25,000 refugees in Maurita Mauritania, in a population of Western Sahara itself, about 610,000. Now, on the 27th of February, 1976, the Polisario Front proclaimed the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic with a government in exile based in Tindouf across the border. Today, Morocco controls about two thirds of the territory, one third to the Democratic Republic with the longest man-made wall in the world. And that pink line that you see there is the wall stretching from the border of Morocco across the separation of the two territories occupied by Polisario and held by Morocco right up to what you may call the beginning of, of the confluence of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. The interesting thing is that this wall, which is called the, the BAM, uh, was built with the assistance of South African army military engineers together with Israelis and the French. And it is dotted with 35 to 40 troops every five, I mean, every five kilometers with artillery, radars and sensors up to 80 kilometers into the Polisario held area and with rapid response forces. This in the heat of about 65 to 70 degrees centigrade in the afternoon of about one o'clock, two o'clock. And you can imagine therefore how many Moroccan troops are in that desert. In 1963, when the Organization for African Unity was formed, the constitution stated that the borders as drawn by the colonialists will be respected. And Morocco was a founder member of the OAU. Now, there are two traditional theories that define a sovereign state. The one is called the declarative theory, which says there must be a defined territory there must be a permanent population, there must be a government, and there must be, that government must have the capacity to enter into relations with other states. The other one is the uh, constitutive theory, which simply says that one or more states that recognize you uh, constitute enough and understanding that you can be a sovereign state. Now, by 1980, 35 African states had recognized the Sahara Arab Democratic Republic. In 1982, Morocco and its allies threatened that they will cancel their membership of the OAU 
if Western Sahara was admitted in that body. Now, in that same year, the heads of state emphasized that if Morocco walks away, she can as well walk away. In the meantime, the Polisario Front continued with the freedom war that they had started in 1976, capturing men and equipment on the wall and bringing prisoners of war and the captured war material to Tinduf. And today, when you go to Tinduf, there is actually a museum where you see pieces of material written clearly made in the Republic of South Africa. Now, in uh, can you still hear me? We can still hear you, uh, General. Good. You, you are clear, General. That's right. Thank you. Hmm. Um, now. Yes, we can uh, hear. Thank you. We can hear you, General. Right. This is how then uh, MK comes into the picture. Uh, MK was invited through obviously the leadership of the organization, the ANC, President Mohammed Abdel Aziz, the founder and president of the Polisario Front and of the Sahara. The crack commandos to see how the Polisario Front fights in the desert and to come and fetch that South African army material to familiarize their, their, their troops in the camps in Angola, in their own camps, indeed. Six commanders led by hero of the liberation struggle, the late General Lennox Njojo Charlie, posthumously appointed Lieutenant General, led the group. And I had the honor and privilege of being in that group of six. We spent two weeks deployed. That was in 1988, July, August. We spent two weeks deployed with the Polisario Front. And may it please you also that this ambassador who is with us on this platform today actually received us and also received President Tambo with his delegation when they came not only to visit, but to support the people of Sahara and also to see that indeed we are there ourselves. And those experiences remain etched in the memory of the people of the Sahara Republic, that out of that material that we saw, lots of it were sent to Angola and divided amongst MK and Swapo. Right? And so here was a liberation movement, small in Africa, helping out fellow liberation movements. That is for another day, another session. Now in 1992, the UN called for a ceasefire and established the UN mission for a referendum on Western Sahara called Minoso. The referendum is aimed at surveying the legitimacy of who is a legitimate citizen of Western Sahara with the participation of Morocco and Polisario. And Morocco has consistently frustrated this referendum, torturing, arresting, detaining, and killing activists in the occupied territory. But we understand why Morocco would be against this because right from the time of the Green March with 300,000 people, the intention was to populate the territory with numbers bigger than the legitimate Western Sahara citizens themselves. So that when that referendum comes, it must be difficult to delineate on who is who. Children would have been born whose home that they know is only Western Sahara. Morocco, despite the fact that when the United Nations says a territory is non-self-governing, nobody has got a right over its resources, 
Nobody has got a right to build infrastructure, but Morocco allows multinationals to extract phosphates, Western Sahara being the third largest uh, holder of phosphates in the world, and pillages and plunders the waters for fish in the waters of Western Sahara. African countries have become inconsistent with their relations with the Sahara Democratic Republic. And I would like to give you a few examples, not necessarily in chronological order. You take Zambia. In 2005, they allowed the Sahara Democratic Republic to set up an embassy. And in 2011, they canceled that relationship. In 2012, they resumed the relationship which they canceled in July 2016 and resumed it three months later, October 2016. Burundi. Burundi recognized the Republic in 1976. It froze the relations in 2006, resumed them in 2008, and canceled them in 2010. Namibia has been consistent from 1990 as has Nigeria from 1984, and Mozambique from 1986, and South Africa from September 2004. When she was chairperson of the AU, Dr. Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, she lobbied heavily at the United Nations for Western Sahara, including appointing a special envoy former President Joachim Chisano, with which our forum works very close. The former UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, visited the camps in Tindouf, Algeria, and described Morocco as an occupying force, whereupon Morocco expelled the United Nations staff monitoring human rights abuse in the occupied territory. Dr. Mustafa Kaloko, AU Commissioner for Social Affairs in 2016, reassured the people of Sahara that Africa could, Africa will stand side by side with the Sahari people until victory is achieved. Yet, at the 28th AU summit of heads of state, of the AU, as I said, in Sierra Leone in January 2017, Morocco was readmitted with 39 member states saying yes and only nine saying no. South Africa itself, uh, through uh, Namibia, uh, uh, co chaired a SADC solidarity conference here in Pretoria in March 2019, 25th, 26th, March 2019, which was attended by 14 African heads of state and representative of government of the entire SADC region. And all in all, 32 heads of state or representatives of governments in Africa including uh, some coming from Nicaragua, Cuba, Timor-Leste, and so forth, and 12 civil society organizations from the entire African continent. And it said, in, to sum up what it was saying, it said, we declare, that's the Pretoria Declaration on, of SADC on Western Sahara. We declare that we remain un equivocally committed to the cause of the people of Western Sahara. And that is total self-determination, total withdrawal of Morocco from the territory. And so we're wondering how then, when King Mohammed VI of Morocco says, Africa is indispensable to Morocco, Morocco is indispensable to Africa. 
And yet the same organization goes against the Constitutive Act of the AU and formerly of the OAU that was saying that member states shall respect each other and the sovereignty of each other, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, resolution of disputes by peaceful means. And yet Morocco will be sitting side by side with member states doing exactly the opposite of each one of these important tenets of the Constitutive Act of the AU. And so we say that this is then the big thorn that this theme was talking about, the thorn that sits in the flesh of the African Union between, uh, between I think between, uh, in the last five years or so, Morocco has signed agreements with African states to the tune of more than a thousand. And Morocco being the fifth largest economy in Africa is waving the, 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 the wallet and, and buying uh, one state after another on the African continent. And this is what we have got to resolve as we celebrate Africa Day tomorrow. I thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, General Keith. Very informative. And your presentation really showed us that um, the people of Western Sahara also made a contribution in our own liberation in South Africa. If you were given an opportunity to go there as a member of MK, to also get some armaments that were taken away from their enemies and you shared that uh, in your camps as MK, it was a contribution from the people of Western Sahara. Colleagues, Without a waste of time, now it's time for inputs, questions, and comments. Like I stated, you'll raise your comments or input, and I'll allow a General Keith to respond. And at the end, we'll then allow His Excellency Ambassador to give closing remarks. I'm going to put down the map for now, and I'm going to put down the map for now, and I will request that when you ask your question, if it's possible, switch on your camera so that we can see who's speaking. Uh, we want to see who's speaking, then we can we can respond accordingly. The first person to go will be Sushupo Masala, followed by Joe Komani. We've got two hands for now. We'll go for uh, Sushupo Masala, followed by, by Komani. Uh, over to you, Sushupo Masala. Oh, thank you, Chair. I have a uh few questions. Um, <clears throat> I have read up on um, Sushu Komosala from the Northwest University, a PhD candidate. Um, my question is about the, uh, the acceptance of Morocco in the AU. How does that affect um, the current referendum? And secondly, um, we know when Trump left, he had uh, made a deal with, with, with Morocco. Uh, to move the consulate to, to Western Sahara. And how does that even affect the referendum? Uh, for His Excellency, I have a question because I've, 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 I've engaged uh, quite a number of people, some of them from Morocco. They con co continuously claim that, that there, there is a historical relations between Morocco and Western Sahara. Maybe the, His Excellency would, 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 would uh, provide clarity on that. And um, my last question is uh, to, to the general. 
what does this say about uh, um, uh, the AU? You, you are talking about uh, the AU says this and doing the uh, another thing which is totally different. What does this say you are about our, the character of our leadership in the AU? I mean, in the current Agenda 2063, the AU talks about you know removing all uh, occupations, including in Western Sahara and few uh, islands around Africa. So what does this say about the character of our leadership, where they say that they are, they are committed you know, to 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 um, to eradicate your colonialism, but yet at the same time they are perpetuating it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Super Masala. We'll go to Joe Komani, followed by Good News. Uh, after that, uh, Komani. Uh, uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, from a post-colonial critique, the, the the first thing that I would like to do is to disagree. With no, this notion that uh, the, the, the issue of Western Sahara is the thorn in the flesh of the EU. It is not, because if there is a flesh, a thorn in your flesh, it becomes itchy. And if it is itchy, you do something about it. And then from the presentation of the general, it is very clear that the EU has done what they have done, it is insufficient other than lobbying with the United Nations. And then we know that the United Nations is not going to do anything. And then we also know that due to the geostrategic and economic value of Western Sahara, they, the West has got a hand in it. And that is not going to, if we keep on looking for the United Nations to solve the problems without allowing the African Union to take the lead in solving the problems of uh, in, the, in solving the problems in the African context, then we are not going anywhere. So it is not a, a thorn, it is, a, it is an afterthought because it's not troubling them. You can see we, if we got to the African Union, it is, it is a very, uh, uh, a, it, to me, it's a cabal of leaders who would go there and sit down and pat themselves on the back to say that this is we are doing it. But uh, we need to judge the role of AU in terms of the extent to which they are contributing towards the demo democratization of different countries. And then if you look at African countries, most of them, they are not democratic. At the face value, they are. But if you go deeper to analyze the intricate political dynamics within those particular countries, you'll find that they are indeed not democratic. Switzerland is not democratic, so is Zimbabwe. And, and other countries in Central Africa. So I, I wonder whether is it possible that they can solve the problem of Western Sahara, given the fact that this problem is deep seated in colonial, patriarchal, imperial, racist canon of thought. This is a, a problem which was manufactured by the West. So it, there is no way in which you're going to sort it out when you are dealing with it by always going to the United Nations wanting to, to solve the problem. Remember, United Nations is made up of people, and those particular people are influenced to a such extent by many, many pe powerful people who have got interest in the Western Sahara. Western Sahara is rich in natural resources. We have mentioned the phosphate, we have mentioned there is iron ore, there is fishing, and then all, all, all these things, the list, the list is endless. So we, we need to make sure that we craft a, pro, a, a solution which is African orientated in the context of Africa. We need to take, when I'm saying Africa in the context of Afri uh, Africa, I mean we come up with a solution which takes the, which contextualize and historicize the, 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 the Western Saharan question to say that this country was colonized by Spain. This country is rich in mineral resources and these European countries, whatever that which they are doing, they want to perpetuate their control in those particular areas. I'll pause for a while in that one. Thank you, Sibi. Thank you, Koman. I, I'll take uh, good news. From, from there, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll then go back to the general to respond. Then I'll take other, other colleagues, uh, uh, Corporate Johnny and, and Ada, you'll follow after after general has responded. I have noted your hands. Uh, good general. evening, Chair. Yeah? Good evening, Chair. Good yes, evening, Mr. Keith Mokope. 
and good evening, everybody. Good my evening. question, my question is around uh, what is it that we can make of this uh, kind of dispute as South Africans, in so far as the quality of the African leaders, uh, especially if they can in their various uh, capacities be so inconsistent in dealing with an issue that is very clear. And also about the strength of the African Union as a, an organization that is supposed to have order. It seems like there is no order here. Those are the two questions. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, good news, uh, General. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mosala requested a comment from the ambassador just on what, how is it that Morocco gets readmitted into the AU and what does it mean for Donald Trump to uh, recognize Morocco's occupation in exchange of Morocco normalizing relations with Israel? Your Excellency, would you like to take those? Your Excellency? Okay. Um, uh, uh, to Masala, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are a PhD candidate on, on African politics. That's uh, congratulations. I hope uh, uh, you, you finish your dissertation and, and join us in, in, in the struggle uh, that has been so long and it's still continuing. Um, Morocco lobbied. Morocco lobbied. You should understand that even here in South Africa, as we recognized, as we recognized the Polisario Front, uh, we only downgraded Morocco's uh, embassy. Morocco is still here, uh, uh, the charge defense. And uh, uh, he lobbies, he lobbies journalists, he lobbies every day. And, uh, and poor Sahara Arab Democratic Republic with little resources competes with a major power that is backed by Western countries. And not just Western countries, but powerful Western countries. And that is why big uh, Donald Trump simply instructed Morocco, you, uh, you will recognize you to be having extended to all the territory of, of Western Sahara, but normalize with Israel. And Morocco did that. So you got to ask yourself as well, whether in fact, the people of Morocco themselves agree with what their country does, right? The same then I can take through to the questions that are asked by Komani and, and, uh, and good news that uh, uh, what do we uh, make? And it is not for us to condemn here, but it is for us to say our uh, solidarity for us works with organs of civil society. And it is organs of civil society which will be able to dictate to governments what line should be taken about Morocco. So um, uh, um, uh, not long ago, two years ago, assisting the late ambassador of the Sahara Arab Democratic Republic here in uh, Pretoria, uh, there was a ship destined for uh, New Zealand, I think it was New Zealand, Your Excellency, carrying phosphates. And when it docked uh, in, uh, in, in Port Elizabeth, we made it a point that the sheriff enters the ship, the ship was arrested, and the cargo ultimately was auctioned as the ship was leaving. Obviously, you cannot take that uh, cargo back into, into the soil, but civil society can actually pressurize their governments to do the right thing. And when you see countries like Zambia, one time canceling, one time resuming, et cetera, it is that civil society is there to ensure that the government cannot just do as it wishes. So here in South Africa, my chapter covers Southern Africa. The Kenya one is very strong. It covers East Africa. The Nigeria one has got academics, the trade unions, et cetera, very strong, covers West Africa. 
And every five years we go to Algeria, the Algerian one is actually backed by government. It's got a budget from government and it calls everybody from all over the world uh, to, to the summit. And then we also visit the, the camps. Now, here in Sadek, for the fact that uh, Minister Dindiwe Sisulu was with the uh, Namibian counterpart, was actually to have that conference as a, as, as a government conference, will make it difficult for countries like Malawi just to say, we freeze because they are part of SADC, they get bound by SADC. But at the same time, Morocco is dangling money and you could see even with this vaccine story, we all, our heads of state go to France as they, as they get summoned by Macron to come and beg for money to buy uh, vaccines for their own people. So what if that is the case, how will those heads of state then say, you know, France, we know that your companies are, pl are plundering Western Sahara. Your, your, your government is supporting Morocco. In fact, you veto some of the resolutions at the United Nations Security Council. African countries cannot say so. So how do we balance this? I would like to leave it at that. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, uh, for now, uh, Mr. Komani and, uh, and, and, and good news, I, I cannot comment when you people say that uh, uh, what do we say about the quality of leadership? Let's leave it there for now. Thank you, uh, Thank you, th uh, thank you, General. We will take uh, Comrade Johnny Mosala, followed by Comrade uh, Zimpia Moyo and Vivita uh, Mang, in that order, and followed by Kidiboni Libya. Uh, Johnny Mosala, Moyo, Kivita Mang, Kidiboni Libya, in that order. Uh, thanks, Comrade Sidiko, and, and thanks, uh, General Keith, and all participants. The attitude of the United States of America on Western Sahara, an attitude that says Western Sahara is actually a financial burden to Morocco, Meaning then, therefore, that uh, in simple terms, even if Western Sahara were to be independent, that independence will not benefit Morocco. Now, that's the attitude of the US. Then, therefore, the question that begs answers is why then, if that is the attitude, is the US still pumping a lot of money into Morocco to ensure that the people of Western Sahara are not liberated. Surely it cannot be for first faith or any other thing. There should be something that is there in Western Sahara that the US is quite sure that if it's discovered, the country is going to be more prosperous than Morocco. And with the ills that the U.S. has shown on the people of Western Sahara, it knows that it has already lost a potential ally. And my guess is that they are fully aware that, that there are rich deposits of possibly oil in the territory. Now, having said that, something that as the people of South Africa, we can learn from the people of Western Sahara is how it would be simple for us to resolve the national question by just being patriotic and owe allegiance and loyalty to a territory and stick to that territory. Remember, the, West, the people of Western Sahara presently only occupy about 20% of what is the naturally their land. And even with that, they do not succumb to pressure very easily. And they are standing fast with limited resources, the struggle continues. Now, as the people of South Africa, how best can we contribute towards ensuring that the people of Western Sahara realize their ultimate liberation from the draconian oppression that they receive from Morocco and the Western imperialist countries? Let me leave it at that, uh, Comrade General. 
thank you, thank you, uh, <coughs> Comrade Mashala, followed by Moyo, Kibitza Mang, and then Kidiboni. Then we'll take other hands. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Mine, well, will be short. I wish it will be long <clears throat> to our, and um, I'm directing these questions or my comments <clears throat> to our guest. Um, you know what is our biggest problem as Africans in general? We are too academic. We are too academic within a system that was created by our, our oppressors. That is our biggest problem. <clears throat> We can talk about this thing of uh, Western Sahara, Morocco, and we can even go abroad and talk about the issue of the Palestinians and the, <clears throat> and the Israelis. But the problem is, firstly, we as Africans, we've allowed a system called, um, what is it, uh, government for the people by the people, democracy. We've accepted a system that was created by our process, which is democracy. And it is the very same democracy that is shaping our thoughts, shaping our studies, shaping our work, shaping even how we live. We'll talk about this issue of, uh, of Western Sahara City and Keith. Today is 2021. Trust me, in 2030 or 2040, the generations to come will be also speaking about this same problem that was created. And here's the problem, and, and I was saying, we've allowed the system that was, was created by our oppressors to dictate how we engage on the subject matter. These people, they've long planned about us some hundreds of centuries ago. <clears throat> now, while we are in power as Africans, <clears throat> we have independence, we, we are free from our oppressors, but we are not free. We are talking about the issue of Western Sahara, but here in the country that we are in, we are still oppressed. Systematically, we are oppressed. Now, if we want to deal with the issue of Western Sahara thoroughly and leave no stone unturned, we must, I, I know this view might sound harsh to many people who, who, might, who are listening to me or might hear this uh, recording thereafter. The only way to deal with the oppressors and the people of, of, of Western Sahara and to deal with Morocco is when we allow a little bit of the element of dictatorship. I know people will be like, we can't allow that. But democracy will never accept. The books that are, were written by them, the research that we are doing, the study that we are doing will never come with a solution regarding the people of, of Western Sahara. Not just people of Western Sahara, even us as Africans, we are still oppressed. Countries in the, in the, in the, in the middle of Africa are oppressed by, uh, by France, but systematically, it is the academic system that we are using that is still in power and that is still destroying us. So if we want to change everything, and if we want to really help the people of Western Sahara, we must shun away from a system called democracy because it's dangerous to us as black people and as black people in this country. And it's dangerous for the people of Western Sahara. Now you've just said um, the AU was now back in the, in the, in the, in the, I mean, Morocco was back in the AU. Why? Because we have allowed democracy. And when you deal with democracy, you must be uh, sophisticated. You know, you be careful how you handle it because it's fragile. This thing, it, as long as we still have democracy in, in Africa, we'll be oppressed for the next 500 years. Thank you, Sidiko and the host, I mean, and the, and the guest. Uh, th thank you, thank you, uh, Comrade Moyo. We'll take Kibitza Mang, then Comrade Kidiboni, then we'll take other hands uh, uh, to follow. No, no, Chair, thank you very much. I'm sure uh, Comrade have said mouthful. I just want to indicate that the geopolitics stroke, uh, the new global networks are defining the moment. Uh, and I do think the general would have reflected the bit that the new formations that are creating a new world, which you could take Israel, 
with, in, with some interest in Africa and the, the entry would be, of course, Morocco because of the, the, for the similarities between what Morocco, what Morocco does to, to, to Sahara, the Saharan people and what uh, the Jews are doing to the Palestinians. And that network is very important because it, it is actually was funded massively when Morocco was allowed to come back to the AU. And the reason being that the divide in Africa of Anglo-Franco Africa has had a, a serious dent in how the politics of Africa will be determined. Now, if we want to look at what are the backbone countries or states of Africa, and look at is Nigeria, is South Africa, is Kenya, in almost in each region, who is hegemonic? And I want to add in general that I think the Moroccans have done have damaged the, the backbones to a point that even South Africa, in their own diplomatic of dealing with things or international relations, they have something called the national interest. And in somehow that compromises the solidarity movement generally, because we then look at what is in the interest of the state or the country as against the solidarity. And that's why we have assumed a very quiet kind of diplomacy where we criticize in podiums, but we can't sponsor uh, sanctions, we can't sponsor radical points because our interest is on the basis that we should always cater for, 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 for national interest. So maybe the general, when he comments, he must come back to the point without looking at this problem as an African problem, but as a global problem and the formations of new networks, a global network. It's, that's the first point. The second point that we should deal with it is the fact that what do we do what, in relation to solidarity movement in general? Because there's so much to look at. And, and, and I mean, this Franco Anglo divide in Africa has just, just damaging impact on, on solidarity movement. I'm sure if the, the general could equally comment about what do we say about those issues. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, uh, The last person for this round will be Kidbone uh, Libya. Then we'll take other hands after that. Thank you very much. Uh, blessed evening, General, and to yourself, uh, facilitator. Mine is just a few questions for clarity. It just it's safe to say, one, it's um, it's seated here with a lot of questions that uh, you'd not normally get somebody brave enough to be able to, to speak on issues with regards to the continent, the political discourse that is happening around the continent. I don't want to just speak on the issue of Morocco and the, what we are discussing uh, currently like that, but I have a question emanating from your presentations, uh, General Keith, and also part of the material that one have been reading. Suffice to say, we are told that part of the AU Constitutive, um, Constitutive Act is to, to promote unity, solidarity, cohesion, and cooperation amongst the people of Africa and African states. But then when you look uh, at the African Union uh, now, General Keith, one sits here and wonder, what is the role of the African Union? Is the African Union losing its basic objective that was set up on, or what is happening? It goes back to one 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 person who was attending with us raised an issue to say, uh, "Are we are we not having leaders who has got enough to attain that the African Union wanted to attain for the people of the continent?" I'm raising this issue, uh, General Keith, because there is a, there are a lot of challenges in the continent. Chair, seated here, uh, um, racialized discrimination uh, discrimination is part of them. Ethnic hatred and religious intolerance, we see it happening all 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 around the parts of the continent. But what are we then saying? What is the African Union saying? Why is the African Union quiet about the issues that are also now going on in Palestine and Israel? 
the leadership is quiet and you are seated here, you say, you go back to say, what is the role of the African Union? But then when you look around, you get to wonder and say, but what is the main interest of the international community in the challenges of Africa? International committee has been in the challenges of Africa since inception, General Keith. But why are they not finding solutions? Does it mean that the international community are finding joy in the situation that is currently taking part in our continent? We have a major problem of hunger. We have a major problem of inequality. Africa is the poorest, richest country in the world as we speak. But the international community seem to be in the center of all these challenges without solution. So are we saying now, is the African Union silent? What is the African Union supposed to do in this political discourse in Chancha? Is it not really about time, General Keith, that we get African solutions for the African uh, problems and challenges that we see now? Because one, the continent is rich in everything, but we are, we are well of being in abject poverty. I don't want to speak about the whole challenges. I'm, I'm sure, General Keith, you know uh, uh, what is happening in the country now. But in the, in the continent, it's safe to say that. And what is happening, it, it, it says to us that maybe there must be something done to the African Union as a, as, as a setup, or it must be radicalized. Or the leaders that are leading you know, a, a, a chairperson are supposed to just say, what is it that we do? Do we disband do everything? What do we do? Do we start from the beginning? How do we then integrate? Because I believe the, the continent, Africa, Mother Africa, we have our own solutions. But who is brave enough to tackle the, the, the challenges head on? Who is brave enough, General Keith, to say, look, Africa belongs to Africans. We are here. We can take decisions on our own. We are able to take and take charge and change that that we want to change and attain as Africans. But uh, I believe that with this Africa Day coming, we must come up with a solution. And seated here, uh, General Keith, I'm saying, really, uh, uh, the boardroom talks, the platforms, the presentations, it's really bad enough. When are we going to go back to the ground? When are we going to, back, to go back to the drawing board to say in, enough is enough? South Africa, the continent, belongs to us. Let's stand up. Let's take charge and become the solutions that we want to see in the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kidiboni. Uh, we'll allow uh, Comrade Keith to, to respond. Then we'll take Arthur, Arthur and we we'll take uh, Honorable Member Janif Hendricks, followed by Comrade Tolo in that order. But for now, let's allow Comrade uh, General Keith to respond. General Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Sidiko. I've just seen a chat here. Someone, not someone, Joseph Coman has written that uh, Africa has got leaders without vision, intellectuals without thought. Ooh, that's very, very heavy. Very, very heavy. Let's go back to Western Sahara then. Now, Maybe we should go one step back and remember the rationale that created the founding of the Organization for African Unity. When Krumah said, Africa will be free only when the last colony is free. And to that extent, the OAU pulled all its resources with fewer countries at that time. Uh, and later on, of course, uh, it became a very powerful UN recognized organization. And uh, 2% of the GDP of every country was to be uh, contributed to the OAU Liberation Committee. And at that time, there was total resolve by the OAU for Southern Africa to be liberated. Unilateral Declaration of Independence by Smith in Rhodesia, the Portuguese and apartheid South Africa. And indeed, much as South Af Africa could not offer, Africa could not offer military bases except for a few countries, could not offer material resources, they gave us land. So it is not like 
Africa has not been one about its total liberation. And um, when the OAU then turned on to become the AU, it was about the economic liberation of the continent. That resolve still stands, as you can see from the recent declarations on the African Free Trade uh, Authority. So we must be able to say the people of Africa do want freedom. And we must always strive to ensure we don't divide the leaders from the people. We could say here or ask ourselves, do the people of Morocco actually want Western Sahara to be occupied, the people of Morocco? How much do we hear about demonstrations, about civil society in Morocco that is saying, hands off Western Sahara? To what extent is the kingdom of Morocco of su subjecting its people to so much silence that they cannot voice a thing? You could as well ask, did the white people of South Africa stand side by side with the proponents of apartheid? Or could we, be, could we be convinced that the liberation of the black people in South Africa was also the liberation of the white population in general? If that is the case, to what extent does that white population in general see a, a joy and greatness in that liberation that we brought to the country? So here we sit with Morocco and when we talk Morocco, are we talking King Hassan, the second who said that you shall invade and the green march? Did the 300,000 people understand what it, what it was all about? And these young soldiers, and I said, it's about 200,000 of the Moroccan army that is on the 2,700 kilometer wall, the longest in the world, bent in the sun every day. Do those 20 year olds really believe that it is in their interest to be on that sand wall? That is the question. So when we talk about whether Africa understands where it is going to, we must be able to say to what extent then, uh, and that's why what, uh, I'm taking these things in their, in, in their, not in their isolated fashion, but someone talked, I think Kibitza Man talked about the global, the new global view. It is the same old global view. It, the, the economic interests of uh, colonialism have not shifted in any way. They may play themselves in different forms, uh, but it is those who you should ask yourself, is it the people of France who are interested in the plunder of Western Sahara, or is it a grouping that we shall name something that is interested in that? Now, obviously the US is interested in, are you able to put that map back, uh, Sidiko? Yes, I'll do that. I'll, I'll Just do put that. the map back. Let's uh, illustrate something. Yes. Now, Oliver Tambo used to end his speeches by saying, for the freedom of the people of Western Sahara and the Canary Islands. And the Canary Islands, there they are, under Spain, literally a few kilometers from the African shore. What does that mean? But which African leader today talks about the independence of the people of the Canary Islands, nothing. But the US will see those areas as very strategic. And indeed they are so strategic that they are very near the, the, the Strait of Gibraltar. And so if you want to control the Mediterranean Sea, you got to control the Strait of Gibraltar, you got to control the Suez Canal for movement around the world. Because if that movement is blocked, then uh, you have problems with the Cape of Good Hope. And you may not be very sure about that government in the, at the southern tip of the continent. So these geodynamic uh, issues come into play about why the US would be interested in Morocco being a NATO ally. That's how, how, how Morocco is called, a NATO ally. Meaning that if you touch Morocco, you touch the US, you touch NATO. And at the same time, the US pumps a lot of equipment, the US armed forces, a lot of equipment into Morocco. Now we don't want a war in the region, definitely, you see? And that's what makes this, the struggle in Western Sahara so difficult 
they are not Arab enough to be assisted by Arab countries, nor are they black enough to be assisted by African countries. They are basically on their own. And much as the Moroccan army did not defeat, I mean, was not, I mean, the, the Polisario was not defeated. The Polisario was not defeated by the Moroccan army. They were stopped only by the ceasefire on, of 1991. And look at how we were saying they were able to capture equipment. So the fact of the matter is the leadership, the political leadership of, uh, of, of, of Western Sahara now is, is having great difficulty in containing their army, in containing their young people, asking for how long will they be burning in the desert of Algeria in, in Tindouf. They want their freedom. So what do we then as Africa say? It's true, Wesley has just written, written me, written here a chat to say, can we organize scholarships as, uh, as South Africans into our institutions and then say that so many come, etc. That's a good gesture. Our own department of uh, DECO, our own DECO every year has, has a budget uh, that we give to the people of Western Sahara to alleviate their conditions in uh, in, uh, in Tinduf. In fact, uh, Steve Trete, may his soul rest in peace. Steve Trete had promised a sports stadium, a sports stadium. Winnie Mandela had said, we're going to send a, 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 one of the Danel divisions to demine because exactly the, uh, uh, where the, the border shows on the, on the Western side of Tinduf, that small little portion that is the, 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 the border between Algeria and Western Sahara that little portion has been mined, you see? So we said we shall help bore water, et cetera, but these things take so long, they become so difficult, but we try our best. We are linked up with the Gauteng International Department and the legislature. We link up with so many different people. Uh, Limpopo wants to have a bilateral agreement with Western Sahara. There are so many things that we would like civil society to do that will then pressure the governments always to, to, to toe the right line. And the right line has been defined by the many resolutions that were adopted by the same leaders that you say they seem not to have a vision. And, and, and I'm saying as recently as uh, Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma having been chairperson, that's yesterday. And uh, they all agreed, let there be a special envoy who looks at this question of Western Sahara. So it is an all front, a front on, at all levels, uh, uh, pressurizing the United Nations, the AU, the non-aligned movement, and even the EU, the EU, because we have on our side, the International Court of Justice that said Morocco has just no right for territorial demands of this, of this country. Um, what are we doing, Kidiboni? It is frustrations I can feel and uh, uh, the uh, Moyo talks about whether there's democracy or not. And uh, uh, there are democratic countries in Africa. There are demo uh, democratic countries in the world that are very, very successful. The question is, do you adopt the right policies and then ensure they are implemented? Ensure there is monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring, evaluation so that when we deviate, we come back to normal. Um, I would like to leave it there, but just note one thing I said. Uh, 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 Morocco is regarded as a NATO ally. You touch Morocco, you touch NATO. Secondly, we cannot go back to uh, saying uh, the 2% the of the GDP in the days of white minority rule must apply now so that uh, we, we uh, uh, arm ourselves to the teeth to, to go and fight. And no, am I saying the Polisario must not fight for their freedom? Ultimately, it is the people of Western Sahara who must guide all of us uh, about what they think is best. Just like we in South Africa, we fought. And in fighting, we guided the international community to know how best to supply us. Others supplied us just with ordinary civilian things like clothes, secondhand clothes, etc. Others gave us armaments. Others gave them just their pieces of land to say you can be here so long as you don't carry a weapon. So everybody had his own little way in which they can contribute to the struggle. And that's what we should do. I leave it there for now, Sidi. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, General. We'll take Ata, uh, take uh, Honorable uh, Hanif, 
and then we take uh, Comrade Dolo. In that order, the three. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Actually, it, it, it General Keith has spoken a lot of things, and in the course of speaking, I think he answered some of my queries. But notwithstanding, um, might be either Ambassador or General Kid could uh, throw a bit of light on the present migration uh, question on more, uh, with involving Moroccan citizens, and probably to reflect on how uh, the weaknesses of the, the, the Moroccan uh, um, society, how the Sahrawi people can um, leverage on some of the weaknesses of the Moroccan government and society, um, to be able to create a stronger propaganda machinery can, that can be, you know, can become a purchase for, 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 for some of the European state to become more interested again or to have a new interest, you know, in the Sahrawi question. Uh, because I was watching TV the other day, I mean, uh, it's also not working for the Moroccans. Uh, you see a lot of them in both, you know, trying to, um, look for survivor uh, in, in the, board, the shores of Europe. So how then, what can the Sahrawi people do in the midst of all this? How they can, can they leverage on these you know, lapses to be able to create a strong message for, you know, for a global audience? Uh, Ambassador General Kid, yeah, mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable Hanif, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Honorable uh, Program Director. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, as a member of Parliament and leader of Al Jamaa in Parliament, we are engaging with the Morocco Embassy with regard to this very issue over the last two weeks. And uh, leading the charge are the younger members uh, of the party, and they have been very aggressive uh, in their dealings with the embassy. We have invited the ambassador uh, to parliament and he spent uh, quite a few times with us before he passed on and uh, he, uh, may his soul rest in peace. We also, uh, uh, we were one of the first people to meet with a new ambassador. And for both ambassadors, the question that we put to them was, we know that uh, the, liber the ANC, the liberation movement led by the ANC has signed contracts uh, 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 to ensure one day uh, that uh, uh, they also get uh, their freedom. So there's a contractual obligation by the ANC uh, uh, to do something uh, to, to speed up uh, the liberation uh, uh, of Western Sahara. So I asked these two ambassadors and they gave me the same answer. I told them, I asked them, now what is the silver bullet? Because a lot of people are saying that most people in Western Sahara prefer to be with Morocco. So that is the propaganda that is going around. So the two ambassadors told me, look, the only way we are going to move forward is to have a referendum. So I asked him now, what voters role are we going to use? Because there will be disputes about who goes on the voters role. Well, Morocco paired it with all its supporters. And then um, they, have, they have been, uh, you know, it's so many years have passed. So a case has been put that we use the voters role that France drew up the last voters role that France drew up. So if two ambassadors tell me that that's the silver bullet, surely this forum must consider it. And I would like to propose a motion in parliament uh, this week um, so that parliament can uh, give effect to the undertaking that the ANC gave, sign documents. You know, it's no use signing documents. You get power in the country. And then uh, after so many years, nothing is happening. So it's important 
for this forum to guide us what should that motion uh, 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 contain so that we, uh, so it becomes a government uh, initiative and not an ANC initiative. So that is my contribution. You know, I would like to know from the retired general, it's nice to see retired generals taking an active part in the liberation struggle, because as we know, as long as nearly 30 countries provide basis for America, Africa will never be free. And I'm also worried that, you know, they will, uh, because of South Africa's position on Israel, that America is planning a regime change here to get the more sympathetic government. So what about Western Sahara? Uh, we have heard repeatedly uh, from the honorable retired general that uh, NATO uh, will be our stumbling block. But uh, that's our contribution. We are engaging with the Morocco government. Uh, it's a bit of a hostile engagement at the moment, but I've now given orders that we must now engage in, uh, there must be a constructive engagement. And we want to put a motion in parliament this week uh, with regard to that, if we get guidance from this forum. Thank you very much for your indulgence, uh, Honorable Program Director. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Harith. And the question is, uh, what should that motion contain? And uh, I'm sure Honorable Kharif would like to get an input to say, so that when they submit that motion in parliament, uh, that motion should be containing something and this forum must guide Honorable uh, Sharif. Uh, over to uh, Comrade Dono. Uh, thank you so much, Comrade Sidiko. Allow me to thank uh, Comrade Keith for the very brilliant, informative and educative presentation that he has made on the, the history of the struggle of the Sahrawi people. I would like to, to make a suggestion that through the, the forum or the, 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 the chapter that supports, uh, the, that is in support of the solidarity uh, of the struggle of the people of Western Sahara, that we should expand this in South Africa. We may perhaps have to consider co co uh, convening a similar webinar where all of us who are here present can participate and see what is it that we can do to popularize the struggle of the people of the Sahara here in South Africa? How do we go into townships, villages, so that ordinary South Africans are not only aware of the plight of the people of, uh, of, of, Sahara, of, of, of Western Sahara, but what is it that we can do? There are a lot of lessons that we can learn from our own struggle. We saw the, ri uh, the rise of the anti-apartheid movement throughout the world, where governments had very little to say, but ordinary people on the street supported the struggle of the people of South Africa and managed to put massive pressure where governments actually started to, to feel the shame factor to support uh, apartheid racism in our country. And I think the similar lessons can be adopted by mobilizing ordinary South Africans. My question then to the ambassador, honorable ambassador is that we would like to know how is life behind enemy lines in Western Sahara? What type of socioeconomic activities are happening? Are the children going to school? Is there any uh, trade and industry happening? In, in, uh, in Western Sahara? And uh, what is it that we can further do if there is a, a, a viable trade and industry to ensure that there is investment inside Western Sahara for its economic prosperity? Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Sidiko. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Tolo. I will allow Comrade Keith to respond then. Uh, we'll then hand over to his Excellency, the Ambassador. But let's not forget the question from uh, Honorable Hanif that he wants to propose a motion in Parliament tomorrow or this week. What should that motion contain? Over to General Keith. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Director. Let me start with uh, uh, Mr. Tolo uh, to say that uh, Mr. Tolo actually gave a, a platform 
to the late ambassador, uh, the, the one who uh, the current ambassador took from uh, in the Northwest uh, during the memorial service of uh, uh, the late uh, Comrade Winnie Mandela and uh, Ambassador Bashir in offering his uh, condolences was able also to put the case of Western Sahara to the people of the province. And, uh, and that is that we, we cannot disagree with the, that approach, uh, 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 Mr. Tolo, that we must go out there to the people, to the institutions of civil society, to the traditional uh, villages, let the people know exactly like what uh, the ANC representatives did in the countries that uh, they, were, they were based in and ensuring that in fact, everybody can take out a rand out of, a, or a cent out of a rand and say, I help, I help. Um, and, and that leads one to um, a, 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 a member of parliament, Honorable uh, Hendricks, that there are two aspects here. Uh, what Ziggs, what Mr. Dolo talks about, what is life like uh, behind the enemy lines? Behind the enemy lines, uh, in, in occupied Western Sahara, there is a fight going on every day. What you, 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 you remember uh, about the uh, mass democratic uh, uh, movements, uh, protests and demonstrations, uh, etc. that's what is happening. The police are chasing people. Uh, this evening we were trying to get a member of, of, of parliament of Western Sahara. They arrived over the weekend uh, for the Pan-African parliament. Uh, but I think they are preparing uh, some documents for other things to give us a fresh, fresh uh, account of what's happening in the occupied areas. There's a struggle going on there, uh, which makes it very difficult for the, the Polisario Frank's army uh, sitting with weapons in Tindouf and held back by a ceasefire and not a, being able to help their people who are being killed every day. But the other part that is perhaps easier to, to do is the one initiated by the late Steve Trek to alleviate the plight uh, in, the, in the camps. Those camps are worse than any informal settlements you can think of. Uh, uh, they are in the heat, the, 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 there's, there's hunger, there are no roads. And unfortunately, uh, because some of us have got the privilege of going there quite often, uh, uh, the solidarity movements that supply containers, uh, secondhand clothes, etc., are European uh, uh, people's movements, uh, uh, solidarity organizations. I haven't seen a single African, I haven't seen a single item that they would say this comes from country X. And it is not like all African countries are poor, right? So that assistance that we can give uh, materially and, and, and verbally and, and by declarations to support our governments, uh, which themselves can take out some run at our pleasure to ensure that we, we minimize the sufferings in the, in the, in the camps, all right? Um, now on Atta's question of immigrations. Now, the problem of immigration uh, across uh, the, 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 the Mediterranean is a serious indictment on Africa because many of the migrants that leave Morocco are actually uh, from the Gambia, they are from Niger, they are from Chad, they are from Ghana, they are from black African countries going to seek a better life in Europe, the modern slaves. Right, so uh, 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 Italy and Spain think that Morocco has got sufficient resources to keep them and not to allow them to float into, into the sea with their rickety boats. I'm not saying that there aren't Moroccan uh, migrants as well. And, and I'm not saying life in Morocco is so rosy that everybody wishes to stay in Morocco who is Moroccan. Uh, there is very little that we know about what the life is of Morocco. Uh, we know that they were not touched by the Arab Spring. 
and, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore the spat that's happening between Spain and, and Morocco uh, is obviously going to be solved by the two of them amicably because they belong to the same boat that uh, if we quarrel, then we will be showing weakness to Western Sahara. It's important that they have that bond, right? Now, uh, as to what we can include in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the motion that is going to be put forward, and this would, my, my suggestion indeed would be this humanitarian assistance, including opening our institutions of, of learning to the young people of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Western Sahara. And let me hasten to say, again, it embarrasses Africa when we see so many of uh, Western Sahara youth going to Cuba to study there and becoming doctors and engineers, etc. And we say here in South Africa, we who were given weapons to, to fight our own liberation, we hardly can in our more than 20 universities and so many tea vets take a few, take a few. And this perhaps the ambassador should, should comment on. Um, there is uh, the question of sanctions. Uh, uh, never has Africa raised uh, uh, the question of uh, sanctions against Morocco, not even South Africa. So uh, one wonders how uh, that would pan out. And perhaps an honorable uh, member of parliament can also put in that that uh, South Africa must consider championing uh, sanctions against Morocco in, in various forms, in various forms. And even when Morocco said it shall not allow uh, African competitions of football to take place there, it was more about COVID than about African countries saying, we shall not allow our clubs to, be, to play in that country. So there isn't that understanding even in our own institutions about what is at play here. Uh, I think uh, I can leave it at that for now. Uh, 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 Mr. Sidigo. Thank you so much, General. Yeah. Let's allow, let's allow uh, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador, to give us closing remarks. And in the meantime, uh, uh, Comrade Keith, look at the chat boxes uh, if there are some questions that are raised there. Uh, Honorable, uh, I mean, uh, His Excellency Ambassador, it's time for you to give some remarks. Uh, have you got his phone? Check. Is he, can you see him in? Yes, yes, I am yeah, in, in, my general. Oh, okay, thank you. Your thank orders, you. my general. It is, it is. <laughs> First of all, uh, let me start with paying tribute to young men who came from the oppressed South Africa during the apartheid time, very young men and women who came to join us to train in a very difficult conditions. I remember the last group that uh, Keith, there were many groups, uh, the late Tommy Sandelo, who used to be comrade, may he ma rest in peace, who was the representative of INC in Algiers, in coordination with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, commander in chief of Mohontu Wisizwi, Chris Hani, and in, uh, uh, under the orders from the late great Pan Africanist and great internationalist, Artambo, have been organizing group of ONC cadres to, to, to join the Polisario Front to struggle with us to turn on on uh, landmines, on logistics, on artillery, on armored uh, tanks, on uh, the work of the political commissioners. One of the groups that uh, was there, among them our brother, uh, retired uh, Major General Keith Mukwapi, among others. They were young men coming from Southern Africa. It's a beautiful weather. The, for their bad luck, they came to us in July. And it was very hot. The degrees will reach 50, 51, 52 Celsius. But those young men, they were very brave. We, they were surprised us with their determination, with their, determination, with their bravery, with their uh, 
sense of discipline and with their courage, very courageous men. They went to the struggle, they went to the front, they fought with us, they bared the very difficult conditions, but they were true men, true Mokhuntu, we see we soldiers, and we, uh, all those who, who met them, they still remember them till now. Of course, with their then uh, non digach with their special names that Mokhuntu, we see we used to give to their soldiers. So I pay tribute for all of them, and I want to thank the director of this program and our uh, great general, uh, Keith Mukwapi, and all the distinguished uh, comrades and brothers who joined us for this debate for this evening. This debate for this evening is very informative and very important, and it's a gesture of solidarity that is, we are very grateful and recognizant for all you of you who participate in it. We were around 50 comrades uh, since the beginning, and now we are 40, 40 39, 40. Uh, the idea, I want to uh, start with the form uh, of uh, South African solidarity with Western Sahara. Yeah, Keith will agree with me that the ideas that presented by Comrade Tolo are very pertinent and very timely. This forum should do more political uh, pressure, more mass action, more we should be going to Soweto, Mama Lodi, Amans Kral, uh, Shishongovi, to the cities, to the townships, to the provinces, to the municipalities, to the branches, local branches on the regions uh, of ANC and of the alliance and of the NGOs. And I am totally at your disposal. I am ready to go for any event you invite me. I understand that I came in this special conditions of COVID, which I wish it will be over very soon, uh, but we are ready to go to the public, to the public opinion, to the ordinary citizens of Africa, wherever we find a platform to speak. We have also to co-opt and recruit some celebrities, singers, writers, uh, personalities, there from sport and from art and culture to join us, because the public listen to them and they are uh, influencers. I have also to do more picketing on the Moroccan embassy line and I want to pay tribute to the trade union Nihau, who already has done several times. We are more trade unions and more organized uh, labor or organized citizens can do the picketing because Morocco is implementing a colonial plan in Africa. Morocco will not resist us one week if he is not the support of France and the support of the United States and the support of the West. It's exactly like apartheid uh, co uh, government and apartheid criminal regime that was in South Africa. So only pressure, they understand it. Uh, only engagement we can do with Morocco is pressure, demonstrations, picketing, motions, action. And from now on, we use the word C, S, sanctions, boycott, disinvest in Morocco. That's what hurt them, what that really uh, listen to, and that what they are afraid of. Unless we uh, go, pressure our government and the African Union and the United Nations and the European Union to do a regime of sanctions against Morocco, Morocco will never cooperate with the United Nations to organize the referendum. And that's why, uh, and here I come to, to uh, and I want to greet uh, Honorable Hendrik and uh, salute him for the initiative he is taking, of which we are very, very recognizant and uh, uh, full uh, express our full support and the gratitude. But we should introduce in that motion the word as sanctions against Morocco to comply with the obligations enshrined in the Constitutive Af Act of African Union. Ask the African governments to enact and implement the provisions of 
the African Union Constitutive Act. And, and Morocco, who have signed it, accepted and signed it, and ratified the Constitutive Act, must abide by it, abide by it or face sanctions and the explosion of the African Union. The membership of African Union comes with a certain obligations and duties that Morocco should respect and should comply with. That he mustn't think that being a member of African Union is finished. They have won the war. Maybe he have put himself in the trap that we wanted him to put himself. We have to caution his respect to his obligations as a member country to the African Union. Has he complied with those rules, with those regulations? Otherwise, he must face a regime of sanctions that go gradually till the expulsion of this country from the ranks of African Union. So the motion must start with the language to introduce this language in the motion. It's a starting, uh, just we think about it, we advise about it, then later we urge the government to do sanctions against Morocco. Otherwise, Morocco will not cooperate, neither with African Union. Now Morocco has closed the African Union office in Western Sahara. Uh, did not allow the African Human Rights Commission to visit Western Sahara. Does not allow the African Parliament, Pan-African Parliament to visit the territory. Does not allow the officers of the African Union to go to the office of the African Union in our capital city, Ayun. So Morocco has to cooperate fully with the United Nations or African Union for this uh, organization of the referendum, otherwise must be ready to face uh, sanctions till he comply with his obligations in international law and re in regards with the African Union. Regarding the situation as it stands today, uh, Morocco have uh, uh, excluded African Union, and they say it publicly, they will not accept African Union to mediate or to intervene or to deal with Western Sahara, which is contrary of being a member of this organization. Morocco have reason and stopped the work of United, the efforts of United Nations to mediate between us and them and have freezed the action of MINURSO, which is the United Nations mission in Western Sahara. Uh, forbid them from any contacts with the population. Forbid them from any work on the human rights or the monitoring of the exploitation of the natural resources. And Morocco have freezed the negotiations through non-cooperation with the, the then uh, envoy here, Skohler, who have resigned two years ago and the United Nations have failed to substitute him. More dangerous, Morocco have attacked Sahrawi civilians who are doing a peaceful demonstration in the strip of Gargarat and attacked them with munitions and have admitted through a public communique that he's sending his army beyond the berm, beyond the line, the, the, the demarcation line to attack our civilians in a clear violation of the ceasefire agreement. At that moment that happened on the 30th of November last year, we resumed in retaliation to this action and in actual defense, legitimate defense, out of self-defense, we retaliated through uh, freezing the ceasefire agreement. And as we speak, the two armies are engaged on daily basis with the Moroccan army and the Sahrawi army along the Birim, which was explained by, by Keith on the 2,750 kilometers from Southern Morocco till Northern Mauritania, crossing the, all the territory of Western Sahara. So as we speak, the second wave of the liberation struggle is going on. The Sahrawi army is fighting and that fight and that struggle will not stop till we have a guaranteed, serious, credible, United Nations sponsored referendum of self-determination where the Sahrawi people exercise their inalienable national rights. Also, as we speak in the occupied territory, there is a daily struggle. There is a daily, day and night, fight of the youth, of the women movement, of the youth movement, of the trade unionists, of the normal citizens with the Moroccan uh, repressive 
police and security apparatus. As we speak, there are more than 50 political prisoners who have been detained through the uprisings and the demonstrations and the picketing and the hunger strike that is organized by the civil resistance in the occupied territory. As we speak, the people in the liberated territory and the refugee campus are continuing with their uh, struggle duties daily. We hope that this second wave of uh, the second phase of our national struggle will get strengthened from time to time. Uh, from now, every day is we make it harder for Morocco from yesterday. And tomorrow will be harder than today. And through this uh, accumulative if, uh, effect of this struggle, in the end, it, we, uh, it, it produced this quantitative, uh, quantitative steps of this continuous struggle will result and the qualitative result that will repressurize Morocco to do a substantial and serious and tangible negotiations that will pave the way to the independence of Sahrawi Republic and the respect of its uh, territorial integrity and its national sovereignty. And that's where we are today. As, as we speak, uh, yesterday, there were a heavy fighting uh, where we have, covered, we have uh, killed Moroccan coronel. Morocco, till now, they are trying to hide their losses. But through the, the mass media, through Facebook and Twitter, and in, in their uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, uh, condolences to their families, the others, their father was a coronel who was serving in Western Sahara. So there are leaks about their losses uh, their, on, on a daily basis. And as we uh, come closer to the heavy summer, which will be June and July, their losses will be doubled and our attacks will be intensified because then in, when the, the degree will 52 and 53, no drones will be able to work, no armament will work, no radars will work, the water will be scarce, and it will be hell during day and night that only we can bear, and they suffer during that. So it's a very good time for us to multiply our attacks against them. We don't expect Morocco to resist this struggle more than two years. So we are hopefully this year, by next November, it will be one year. The second November, uh, the, uh, Morocco will be feeling the heat of the pressure of the struggle and will be more eager to look for a ceasefire that they will not have it unless they do a real concession and recognize the uh, peace plan that the, the brought by African Union that have, they have refused it and they have sabotaged it they will come back under pressure to that. But with the military struggle, we want our friends and brothers and comrades to accompany this struggle with mass action, with solidarity movement, with uh, picketing, with resolutions and motion in the parliament, but also in the, in the province legislators and in the municipal councillors and in the regional councillors, any voice, any resolution, any article, any tweet, any writing in Facebook, all of that uh, uh, with its accumulative effect will produce the necessary pressure on the oppressor to stop oppressing and to comply with international legality, to comply that Morocco must comply with a constitutive act of the African Union, co comply with the Charter of the United Nations, comply with the humanitarian law. And once again, I want to express a name in the name of Polisario Front, in the leadership, in the name of the leadership of Polisario Front, in the name of the government of the Sahara Republic, our deep appreciation for all the participants, all the comrades who participated in the debate, but also for the director of the program and for the retired General Keith Mukwapi and his forum of solidarity with Western Sahara. And once again, I thank you, all of you. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency, Ambassador. Colleagues, there is a challenge there that we need to start mobilizing resources, mobilizing communities to put pressure on our own government, 
to be decisive on the issue of uh, uh, Sahara, Western Sahara. For those who want to participate in activities that are organized by the South African chapter of Friends of Western Sahara, please leave your email addresses on the chat box so that the convener of the South African chapter of Friends of Western Sahara will have your contact details so that when they organize activities, they can directly contact you. From our side as Progressive Social Economic Investment Institute, we'll engage the convener of South African chapter of Friends of Western Sahara and the ambassador. We must have a tripartite engagement on how can we take these discussions forward. This is our first dialogue on Western Sahara. And I can assure you that it's not our last dialogue. It's one of the platforms to raise consciousness. It's not little that we're, what we're doing. We were about 50 when we started, now we're 37. At least today, 37 people came and listened to the struggle of the people of the Western Sahara. We'll continuously uh, organize various dialogues. We'll take them to the municipality level, the regional level, the provinces, but will continuously raise consciousness. So those who want to be part of the activities of South African chapter of Friends of Western Sahara, please leave your email addresses. We'll share them with uh, General Keith. We thank everybody who participated in this session. And uh, let's continue supporting the people of the Western Sahara. Thank you for participating and have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh program director. Everybody, go well. We thank you. We thank you. Did you notice that there were two thank generals? Why? There were two other generals here, Sidiko. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I did not recognize them. Uh, please. Yes. Uh, uh, General Tempe, General Tempe, and General... Uh, and General Del Monte. Yeah, and General Simang. Proud of you. Yeah. Proud of you. There you are. Oh, the the generals, are very, the generals are very active. Can you see? Uh, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> because they are MK. <laughs> because they are MK. Well done, generals. well done, well done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. This thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.